Have you ever gotten caught cheating? I was sat there at the back of the lecture hall. We were having an exam. We we're having an exam and the professor, let's call her Professor S. She was all the way on the front left side. She was quite far from me. So I didn't expect her to be able to see me at all. And this was a thermodynamics exam. If you know anything about thermodynamics, like it's a hard subject. So I had my answers, um, answer sheets where I would write on and I had my question sheet. And under the answer sheet, I had a little bit of extra notes, which I wasn't supposed to have. It was against the rules and I knew it, it was dishonest, but I had these notes under there. And every now and then when I was struggling with a question, I would consult these equations and I would proceed. I would try to answer the questions based on my, my hidden notes. And I was doing that. And out of the corner of my left eye, I see footsteps. I, I hear a little bit of footsteps and I see like her shoes. I see her shoes and I freeze. I try to play it cool. It's like, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to expose myself. I'm going to try to play it cool. Maybe she didn't see me. I shouldn't overreact. And I slide the hidden notes under my sheets and act as though nothing happened. She gets closer. I still try to play it cool. But at this point, my heart's freaking beating, right? I'm, my heart's beating. So at that point, I know the game's up, but I still try to play it cool. And, but she's like right, right to my left. She's right here. She's looking at me and I act as though, you know, nothing, nothing's going on. I'm just an honest student doing my, my work. Why is she disturbing me? She says, would you please lift up your answer sheets? And I do. And my notes are right there. I got caught red handed. She takes the notes says continue on your exam and walks away and the next one hour were a blur you know my heart was pounding i was completely reflexive i was in a very bad mental state because i believed that i would get expelled because i did get caught red-handed and the policy for dishonesty in examinations is ex uh, expulsion from the university but it didn't quite hit me then, you know, I, I did my best, I completed the exam, I submitted the paper, I left, and then it hit me. I was like, shit, my parents spent almost $90,000 over the period of two years, almost 100K of their life savings, basically. So my parents, of course, they're from India. They sold their property, let me close this. They sold their property to be able to fund my college experience and I had blown it right I not only I didn't fail out I literally got kicked out for dishonesty which is the worst so I didn't get kicked out at this point I, I thought I would so I thought I was gonna get kicked out and you know that was the probably the most depressed I've ever been in my life because I had essentially betrayed my parents trust in me I could visualize my mother's sadness and disappointment my father's anger and resentment and that's not something I could face up to and to this day like when I think about that it's like god damn I was in a bad place right yeah man so I mean at this point it might seem like a simple thing but actually that's not even true even now that pain is still there I thought I had wasted a hundred thousand dollars of my parents hard-earned income which they literally sold a property for be to be able to finance my college so it wasn't about the cheating it's about betrayal of the parents but you know i was in a bad place i never got close to you know you know that but if i ever got close to it it was on that day but i received an email from that professor saying you know visit me in my office at so and so time the next day it's like okay fine let me do this let me see what happens and I can proceed based on what happens. So I go to her office, let's call her Dr. S. She's talking to a different student and that student walks out, I knock at the door, she sees who it is, gets me in, and on her desk was the notes that I used, like the, the evidence basically that I cheated. It was right there, you know, there's no denying it, there's nothing I could do, she had the proof, it was in my handwriting, so there was no backing out, there was no it was straight up like, hey, yeah, I, I cheated, you know, I, I broke the rules. And the consequence for that was expulsion. I knew that. I knew the consequence. It's like, okay, you know, I'm going to fucking face this like a man. Let's go and talk this with the professor. Let's see what happens. 
and it was bad for her too because she was a new professor she was new to the job she didn't know what she was doing and she didn't want to have this extra burden of a disciplinary action against a student she didn't want it i didn't want it we were both in this terrible situation which i had put us into and she looks at me and she says why you know why do this you could have asked me for help before the exam i would have gladly given it it's like yeah she probably would have and she asked me did i cheat on the midterms I'm like yeah I, i cheated on the midterms as well and i was i was honest i didn't lie i cheated bo- on both exams i cheated on the homework too but she didn't ask that question so i let it pass and then she's like yeah i'm going to have to i'm going to have to show this to the disciplinary committee or the ethics committee whatever it's called it's like yeah I, i'm aware of this and there's nothing to be said she has to do what she has to do according to the protocol she has to show it to the ethics committee and the ethics committee decides what disciplinary action to take it's like okay fine it's in their it's in their hands i was like okay i get up to leave i'm leaving out the door I'm just about to leave i almost closed the door she said she says wait calls me by name calls me back in and she says the words which i will remember forever she says you know i've decided to handle this internally and i just felt the weight get off my shoulders man because that's basically the code word for saying i'm going to throw these notes in the trash i'm going to forget this ever happened go about your day it's like holy shit this is the best possible outcome this is the best possible outcome she said would, that she would give me a d she give me a zero on the exam i was like okay no fucking problem give me a zero that's fine just let me out of here don't tell the disciplinary committee just i'm done you know so i passed that course a d is not a fail an f is a fail a d is a it's a pass so i got a d in thermodynamics 1 and i passed i was done thermodynamics 1 was done i didn't need to do it again but next semester was thermodynamics 2 and i was not going to put myself in the same position as i did in thermodynamics 1 hell no thermo 1 i was sucking man i was i hated it i was not good at it i didn't know how to learn and that was the thing i realized that i didn't know how to learn until that point i could just use you know my brain power i guess to just grind it out do the repetitions and get good at whatever subject i was trying to handle calc 1 calc 2 whatever it was It was only when I hit thermodynamics 1 as at the limit of my brain's power. So that's why I ended up cheating. That's why this entire episode happened. So thermodynamics 2 is a more difficult course than thermodynamics 1. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to end up in the same exact position if I don't learn how to learn. So between the two semesters there's a few weeks of no classes. I'm going to use that time to understand how to optimize the performance of my brain. and how to really have a system for mastering anything no matter how difficult including thermodynamics 2 and that's the system which i'm going to impart to you today it's the magic hourglass method and this is a actual lecture so i'm going to use an actual whiteboard i have my markers and everything and i'm going to teach you the method which made me immensely successful in a even more difficult topic than thermo 1 So what's the what's a magic hourglass? Good question. Let me draw one out. So let's see. That's what an hourglass looks like. Hopefully the wind isn't making my voice too hard to comprehend. That's an hourglass. Yeah? An hourglass has sand and that sand is going to trickle down and you have more sand. A magic hourglass is when you put sand on the top glass of the hourglass and when it trickles down something happens at this point to turn this into gold so you have g o l d gold dust the magic hourglass is an ancient technology of esoteric or origins and arcane transmutating power this device is now in the lost city of atlantis and i'm going to bring this technology to you today so what's going on in the magic hourglass and what does it have to do with learning all right i will explain the theory behind this at uh, this time so first you have the input that's the sand you're inputting information into your brain which you're trying to master 
And here, the first point under input is take breaks. So let me explain more. I realized that my biggest downfall when it came to learning any subject was I would try to cram because cramming is the technique, all right? It's the technique which they teach in schools in India. And that's where I did middle school, high school. So cramming is the only technique I knew. So the idea of studying was basically, if you have an exam in, let's say, thermodynamics, grab the textbook, start doing problem after problem again and again and again and again, you just cram, cram, cram for like weeks straight and then you hit the exam. Doesn't work, doesn't work. It's not ideal because studying or learning something is not like going to the gym. When you go to the gym, you want to push through the last few reps with all your willpower because that's where the gains are. When it comes to learning, it's not like that. Learning is not forced. Learning is receptive. So when you are trying to learn something, you're going to force it into your brain, man. What you got to do is it's like filling a glass with Coca-Cola. If you try to just glug the entire bottle into your glass, what's going to happen is the fizz is going to rise, it's going to overflow, and when the fizz dies down, you're not even going to be left with that much liquid, that not much Coca-Cola. So what do you actually do? What you need to do is pour a bit by bit. You're going to pour a little bit, allow the fizz to rise, let the fizz settle down, pour a little bit more, allow the fizz to rise, let it settle down, and then pour some more. You do it piece by piece because you need the liquid to settle. That's how learning happens. So when you're studying or learning something, take breaks as often as your brain tells you to. With time, you'll get better and you'll need fewer breaks. But when you're starting out, your brain is going to get tired, it's going to get bored, it's going to get anxious, and it's going to tell you to stop. Take that cue. Stop learning. Step away from your desk. And here's the trick. You do not consume any other input, nor do you distract yourself with any kind of stimulation. All right, so you're studying, let's say you're studying calculus, you're studying mathematics, whatever it is. You get bored, you hit a problem that you can't solve. You'll leave the desk and you do nothing. You do not get on your phone, you do not get on YouTube, you do not watch Netflix, you do not play video games, you don't even check Instagram, you don't even check your text messages, you do not distract yourself by doing so-called productive activities such as cleaning your room, cooking food, nothing. Your only allowed activity is walking. You can walk outside, you can walk inside your house, I don't care. You are not stimulating yourself and you're not giving further input because that's what allows the brain the time to settle that information and actually absorb and distill and you know synthesize it into its brain. So that's how you do good input. Now here, this magic, magic location in the magic hourglass is called transmutation. Transmutation. Transmutation is the magic of taking sand into gold. And in transmutation, I have a couple pointers for you. The first one is passive and it's sleep. So they did an experiment with mice. They took a bunch of mice and put them through a maze, which they like to do, the scientists. And they put probes in its brain to measure its electrical signals. And they measured it while it was solving the maze. They made it, the mouse solve the maze like 10 times in a day. And they got the data. And they let the mouse sleep. And they were looking at the data when it slept. They were looking at its dreams. They were looking at what happens when it has REM sleep. So what they found was, when the mouse was sleeping, it was solving the maze. So the same exact electrical signals while it was solving the maze were recurring when the mouse was dreaming. So the mouse was actually replaying that maze in its head. But here's the thing, it's doing it 100x faster. If it takes the mouse a minute to solve the maze, in its mind while dreaming, it is solving it in 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 1 second, like really rapidly. And here's the key part. It is solving the maze from you know, point A to point B. It is also solving the maze point B to point A. It is also solving the maze in segments and at random order. So the mice, the mouse, was solving a, a computationally powerful, difficult problem multiple times in its sleep. So if a mouse can do that, imagine what the human mind can do. So you need to optimize your sleep to get good at problem solving, memory, 
literally anything cognition based. So how do you optimize sleep? I have a whole video on sleep optimization. I'll link that in the description or I'll have the end tile pop up. That's the video you need to master sleep. So that's the passive technique of transmutation. There are two active techniques which I'm going to teach you. The first, the, the well, second technique, but the first active technique. It is called mental rehearsal. So mental rehearsal. Mental rehearsal is literally what I did to do this lecture. Think about this. I'm giving a full lecture. I'm barely consulting my notes. How is that possible? It's because I've done it two times already in my mind. So they had an experiment. They did an experiment with dart players. You know what's darts, right? They have a, it's like a game you play in. I imagine it as being played in like old timey British bars. Like you have this circle, that's the goal. You have darts, you got to throw it. And the closer you get to the, the center of it, that's the higher points you get. I've never played darts, but I know what it looks like. So they had three groups. Let's call them group A, B, and C. Group A was not given any chance to practice, all right? And they took the score. They, they took the score of what Group A's performance was at this game of darts. Group B got the chance to practice. They practiced and then they took the score. Group C was told, hey, you can't actually practice. What you can do is imagine this is a dart. Imagine a dart and imagine the muscular sequence it takes to launch a dart. Now, like, I don't know how to play darts, but I imagine if I was in that group, if I was in group C, I'd imagine holding a dart, visualizing the center of the target, you know, holding my dart back, kind of making an eye connection and then launching it. That's how I would imagine it. And these guys did something similar. They tried mental repetitions. Now, who do you think they did the best? If hopefully, okay, so this live stream was, I didn't know how to fucking start the live stream. So hopefully it's going on right now. If you think group A won, type A. If you think it's B, type B. If it's C, type C. So to nobody's surprise, group B did the best because group B got to practice. No, no surprise there. And of course, group A did the worst because they got zero practice whatsoever. The surprising finding was group C, which didn't actually practice. All they did was mentally visualize the practice. They came pretty damn close. Like they were didn't beat the group which practiced, but they got close. Like how? How? All they did was practice in the mind. But this is actually a time-tested technique in many sports, especially tennis and golf. What the coaches found was a combination of actual physical practice plus mental rehearsals equals greater than just mental practice or just physical practice. That's mental rehearsals. So you might think, well, I'm not playing golf. I'm not playing tennis. I'm not playing darts. How is it relevant to me? You can do mental rehearsals for anything. You just have to be a bit creative. I did mental rehearsals for this lecture. I want to have, you know, a, a charisma. I want to have a good storytelling ability. I want to have confidence. I want to speak eloquently. I had to practice to do that, but I can't, I didn't, the best way to practice that without actually doing it is in the mind. I practiced this before I came here in the mind, before I slept. It was encoded. I dreamt about it. I had done this a hundred times before I'm doing it because I did it in my REM sleep, right? So at this point, I have, I have the best amount of camera presence I can muster at this time because I've done the repetitions while I was sleeping. That is the power of mental rehearsal. I'll tell you something funny. So I had all the notes for this lecture prepared and printed out and I left it in my desk at home. I forgot to bring it. So I... I set up my setup and everything. I have my camera, like my phone. I have my whiteboard, all that. I didn't have my notes. So 10 minutes before this lecture, I recreated 100% of my notes word for word in this gym notebook, which I have. I will actually show it to you. I created two pages worth of notes from my memory alone. That's the power of mental rehearsal. You can do this for any subject. If you're trying to get good at mathematics, here's what you do. You imagine the, the version of yourself which is fucking good at mathematics, all right? You imagine the version which has already succeeded at learning calculus. So you're not necessarily trying to solve the problem in your mind, though you can do that. What you're doing is you're visualizing that version which has succeeded 
and when he sees a mathematical problem, he's like, ah, okay, so that's how you do this. Starts writing the answer. You know, you can hear the scratching of his pencil on the, on the surface. You can feel him arriving at the conclusions faster than he's able to write it down. That's the visualization you're going for. And this is true for mathematics. Maybe you're trying to learn biology. Maybe you're trying to learn mitosis and meiosis. Cool. You're imagining a version of yourself who already knows it. He knows the steps of meiosis and mitosis. He knows it without any confusion. You're visualizing that person. Why? I was reading this book, Psycho-Cybernetics, and it makes this point very forcefully. That is, your success always lags behind your mental image of yourself. If you believe that you're too dumb to solve a mathematical problem, you are not going to succeed at cracking it. If you feel that you are, your memory is not good enough to memorize all these anatomical names of all the bones in the human body, you're trying to be a doctor, you'll never succeed. If, on the other hand, you have the image, you believe that you are the kind of person who is already good at memorization, already good at solving mathematics, already good at engineering, then when you start solving the problem, your brain is in a relaxed state. So this is not, this is not manifestation. It's not some bullshit girly thing which you think of something is going to happen. No, it's very straightforward. A receptive mind gets better ideas, can process thoughts more fluidly. A receptive mind is open, to, to put it metaphysically, is open to the word of God. And there is no... We don't get good ideas. Good ideas come to you. You cannot force good ideas. And I think it was Nietzsche who said, you only should trust the thoughts and ideas that come to you outdoors in the open. And you know that's why I'm here. That is the power of mental rehearsal. But there was another dart study, another study of throwing darts. And what these guys did, they did the experiment a little bit differently. They had two groups. Let's call them group A and group B. Group A had a external locus of control and group B had an internal locus of control. So I'll explain what locus of control is shortly. What they found was the guys with the external locus of control, for them, mental rehearsal didn't work at all. They did all the mental rehearsal, but they didn't see any improvement. Group B, who had an internal locus of control, they got good through mental rehearsal alone. So what's locus of control? We talked about mental rehearsal. Locus of control is the idea of your mind that you have the ability to control your destiny. Basically, you have control over where your life is going, your surroundings. This is the masculine way to live. You have an internal locus of control. So locus of control is basically, who do you think controls your destiny? If it's an internal locus of control, it means you control your destiny. People with an external locus of control basically believe, you know, the government is going to control their destiny or their genetics is going to control their destiny. Their parenting, their education, their, their looks is going to control their destiny. Internal locus of control, which is what I have, I believe I am in charge. I'm in charge of the course of my life, whether it goes to shit or I become something great. It's on me. I have internal locus of control. It's me. I believe that duty is destiny. This is the lesson of the Bhagavad Gita, which is an ancient religious text. Duty is destiny. You perform the duty that is given to you again and again with the highest caliber of performance and destiny takes care of itself. In other words, I want you to listen to this and then repeat it in your mind as a form of mental rehearsal. Your thoughts and actions shape your character. Character is who you are. And the character shapes your destiny. So say it with me in your mind. Thoughts and actions shape character. Character shapes destiny. That's going to give you an internal locus of control, which is point number three. I'm just going to say I, internal locus of control. ILC. If you have these three, you are transmutating. You're transforming what you learn into something greater into output. So you might have heard of the Feynman technique. All these, you know, Ali Abdal types, they always talk about Feynman technique, you know. Feynman technique is nothing. It's just, if you teach something, you're going to get better at it. So if you're trying to master calculus, you grab a friend, teach him the problem that you learned, 
and as he asks questions and you interact, you get damn good at that subject. Cool. The thing is, most of us don't have very good friend circles or we don't even have fucking friends or your friends are not interested in the same things that you're interested in or are in different subjects than you. So it may not be possible and also maybe you don't really want to talk about like academics with your friends. It's fine. What you do instead is you make a YouTube series. What you do is say you're trying to learn calculus. Become a Khan Academy onto yourself. Start posting on YouTube. Get a whiteboard like this one and be like, hey, you know, calculus, first concept of calculus, differentiation. This is what differentiation is. Or integrals, this is what integrals is. Make video after video explaining the stuff as you learn. Because when you're making a video about something, you have to transmute it. You have to synthesize it. You have to simplify it so your audience understands. You have to make it come to life so your audience understands. You don't need an audience. On YouTube, you can post stuff for free. Maybe nobody watches them, but who cares? You've improved your public speaking. You've improved your presence. You've actually gotten good at that subject. And I know this to be true. So nutrition, I'm very passionate about nutrition. I have a lot of knowledge about nutrition. I learned a lot of nutrition to make these videos. But it's only when I made my nutrition course that I reached a new level of confidence and competence at this topic. When I made the course, I made like 40 modules of nutrition topics. I had to figure out, you know, how does this module fit in the section? How do the sections fit into this course, etc. In doing that, not only did I learn more, also the thoughts which I already had in my head were arranged. It was, it's like taking a Rubik's cube and solving it. I had this unsolved Rubik's cube of nutrition facts. And as I created the course, I was solving it. And at the end, I kind of understood nutrition. I was like, you know, if somebody asked me to give a lecture on nutrition like that, I could probably do it. I could probably do a damn good job of it. And I was confident and competent at that topic of nutrition because I had made a course on it. Now, you don't have to make a whole ass course, but if you do, you will master that topic, guaranteed. That is output. Make a YouTube series. So you're harnessing the power of YouTube for learning, not by watching videos, but by making them, by being in the creator's seat. And that's how the magic hourglass method works. And I use this man, I use this very method to master, to get really good at, at thermodynamics too. So thermo two is a more difficult topic. And it was by a different professor, you know, Dr. S, who I shall not mention her name. She's out of the picture, she's done, that was thermo one. Thermo two was another professor, his name was Campanella. And he was a master of thermodynamics. He was a seven or eight figure entrepreneur in agribusiness. And he loved thermodynamics so much that when he retired, he's like, can I teach at university? And he was teaching this high level thermodynamics class. And of course he was a master in his field, right? Of course he was, he was a professor in one of the best engineering colleges, probably on the planet. And there was one problem he was solving. And the problem was about pipes and how heat escapes from pipes, which is a common thermodynamics problem. And it was a difficult problem and it's actually a very interesting thing. So as you increase the insulation on a pipe, when you go from zero to a little bit of insulation, actually the heat which escapes increases. And then it starts to decrease again as you increase the insulation. So I don't need to explain thermodynamics on this lecture, right? But basically it was a complicated simulation and complicated mathematical equations which, which go with it. And you're solving it on the board and at this time, I was, I was pretty good. Like, I was pretty good at thermodynamics. I was like, you know, this doesn't make intuitive sense to me. And my mathematics is looking a little bit different from what was on the board. So after the class, I was like, hey, professor, you know, I, I don't think this is, like, I, my intuition is telling me that my solution is correct. And he looks over my solution and says, you've got to come to my office at 6 p.m. later today. I was like, okay. You know, I, I knew I didn't do anything wrong. So I was like, I'll go to his office. I went to his office. And this was a parallel to my office visit to Dr. S in Thermo 1. So, same building, right? Same floor even. But this time, I had solved something. I went in, and by the time it was six o'clock, I had run some more simulations. I was getting even more confident of my solution to the problem. It's like, hey professor, like I know I'm right. I ran the solution through Wolfram Alpha, which is like a computational software. 
Like this is the graphs which came out and everything, all right? So the professor sees it, he's like, yeah, I know, because I did the same thing. And he's like, I've been teaching this problem wrong for five years and nobody's corrected me. You are really good at your intuition. And you know, I was feeling really proud of myself. And he says, he says, when you're looking for a letter of recommendation, you come to me. You have to understand, professors don't hand out letters of recommendation. Students have to kind of like beg for them. You have to scrounge around for professors who are willing to write you a letter of recommendation. And this professor, one of the best in his field, offered it to me. It was a, a true honor, a true highlight of my academic career as it was. And of course, I took him up on the offer. I got into grad school because of this experience. And that was through the power of this very technique which I've given you. And, you know, I wish I could just end off at a high note. I had done the technique and I had succeeded, guys. You know, listen to my technique because I succeeded. It wasn't like that, man. So I got good at thermodynamics. I used the same method on other topics. I got good, like I got good grades for the first time in engineering. I succeeded, I graduated with pretty decent grade, I was okay. And graduation was the worst day of my life. Even thinking back about it now, it's like, God damn, that was a bad day. I made my mother cry during the day of graduation. So the reason why I was so upset and depressed when I got caught cheating was because I thought I betrayed my parents and I wasted their money, their hard earned income. Because I was no good at engineering, so I believed. After I actually completed my engineering degree, it dawned on me that I'd have to get an engineering job at this point and I didn't actually enjoy mathematics and engineering. Now I had spent almost $200,000 of my parents' money instead of the 100000 in Thermo 1. I finished my degree, right? I spent $200,000 of my parents' money, probably even more because I didn't even factor in like, you know, room and board, right? So I was like, God, I spent so much of your money, but I don't actually want to get the engineering job that this degree allows me to get. What do I do? I wanted to study biology. I want to study science. And that's not exactly high paying. Engineering is super high paying, but science really isn't. So I was like, fucking hell, I got this degree. I did so much hard work and I still ended up betraying my parents because my parents' vision for me was not going to get filled. And I was very rude. I was very upset, I was very angry at myself, and I let that affect my parents. I was very rude, I was brusque, I didn't thank them for their support over the past four years. And I literally made my mother cry because I couldn't control my own emotions. I wasn't, in, I, I wasn't taking charge of my own actions and my own destiny. So I completed my engineering degree, and the learning lesson here is that you can use this technique to get good at anything. But you shouldn't get good at anything. You should get good at the thing which matters to you. Don't use this technique to get good at thermodynamics if you don't enjoy thermodynamics. Don't get good at soccer if you don't even enjoy soccer. Don't get good at copywriting if you don't even enjoy writing. Don't get good at the guitar if you don't enjoy music. You have a finite amount of time in life if all you're doing is learning and educating and studying to impress your parents, then you are a fucking dork. I was a dork, so not anymore. Fuck that. Now I do things for myself. If you're doing things just to impress your parents, you are a dork. If you're doing things just for money, you are a nerd. If all you're doing is you're learning coding and computational skills because you want to work for Microsoft, you don't actually care about coding. All you want to do is get the high paying job. You are a fucking nerd. Do not study to impress your parents. Do not study to get money. Study, learn and educate yourself because it is a divine duty. Learning, you have to understand the titans of our civilization, Archimedes, our Aristotle, Ptolemy, Socrates, Aryabhat, all these Newton, Galois, Gauss, all these guys, they learned, educated themselves and practiced in order to expand their minds. It's the same as going to the gym, it's the same as practicing combat arts. They were practicing the talents of their mind. Gauss, I think it was, who said, I get it, 
now have to really get it. What he was talking about was the power of intuition and divine reception. So once you make up your mind, you have a why on why you want to learn something. You want to master thermodynamics because you want to create food preservation systems which will save people's lives. All right, That's a good why. Learning, learning thermodynamics to impress your parents, that's not a good why. So let's say you have the why. That point, learning is not a matter of any of these things. It's divine. The heavens will give you divine inspiration on how to get good at stuff. Ideas will come to you. So going back to Gauss and his quote, Gauss was a mathematician par excellence, right? He was a master mathematician. He saw a mathematical problem and his intuition gave him the solution. He knew the solution to his mathematical problem, but he didn't know the steps to get there. So he said, I get it. I see the solution, but now I have to get it because he has to prove his solutions to his mathematical buddies, right? That is the metaphysical and divine aspect of learning. And of course, the opposite to that is the divine aspect of teaching. I do not consider these lectures to be a way to get money. I mean, of course I will, but there's something else going on, right? It goes deeper. The act of learning, creating, transmutation and teaching, which is output, has a metaphysical and divine, how would you say it? Purpose. Purpose is a weak word. Let's go for a stronger word. Duty. It has duty. And of course I said duty is destiny. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this lecture. I have a divine duty to teach you the things that I know. I have a divine duty to teach you everything that I know. A lot of people think that my channel is a health, education, self-improvement channel. Which I guess it's some sometimes is. It's not the end goal, never was. I was working for Hamza, as you know, this was, this was years ago. Hamza is a world-class storyteller and expert YouTuber. And when I was working with him, I realized that I was older than him. I had an engineering job at the time, so this was after my undergrad. I had an engineering job, which was making a fair bit of money. I realized Hamza is not necessarily more talented or more educated or smarter than me. Yet, he was making 10x the money I was making. And it's because he was living to his purpose. He was living according to his mission. And I had a mission too. And because I wasn't living to that mission, I wasn't making half the money he was making. So that's why I started the YouTube channel. Is the mission I had was more important than Hamza's. What's the mission? It's not health. The mission has to do with two axioms. The first axiom is that all governments tend to tyranny. There's been zero exceptions to this rule. Throughout history, you will see that every single government always tends to become tyrannical with time. This is an ironclad rule of history. The second axiom is that for the next 10 years, next 20 years, technology is going to improve. So how do these two combine? It's because in the past, when you had Stalin and Hitler, these tyrants these tyrants wanted totalitarian to, sorry totalitarian control over you they want to control every aspect of your life but they couldn't do it they couldn't do it because they didn't have the technology to do it they didn't have the technology so even though they wanted to know your thoughts they wanted to know your actions they wanted to know your worldview they wanted to know what you read what you ate everything they couldn't do it if you're in you know buttfuck nowhere russia Stalin is not going to be able to enforce his will on you. He couldn't do it even if he wanted to. But if you look at the social credit system in China, at this point in history, because of the technology that we have, including artificial intelligence, governments can actually monitor you in real time every day till the day you die from the, from the time you're born. It's going to happen. I rebel at this. The thought of it makes my skin crawl. I have to do something against it when there's still time. What I'm going to do is create a parallel society. A society, a group of, a group of men and women who think of healthcare and education differently. That is what I want to establish, I want to create. That is why I do what I do. 
That's the purpose. That's what makes this all worth it. So, I, I started doing this in my private community, Carl's Country Club. Speaking of which, I have homework for you. So you attended my lecture, cool. I have homework for you who are listening right now. I want you to write down one thing that you want to master in the year of 2024. Could be anything, playing the guitar, talking to women, could be social skills, public speaking, making YouTube videos, it could be calculus, it could be trigonometry, it could be any kind of you know, English, writing, copywriting, sales, I don't care. One thing that you're going to become a master of, you can reach the 1% of performance at that one thing. I want you to write a detailed action plan as how you are going to achieve that thing. I will tell you mine. My, the skill I want to master is the skill of camera presence and storytelling. And the detailed plan on how to achieve that is by doing these live lectures. When you have live lectures, there's no editing, there's no fancy graphics, background music, nothing. If you are engaged by this, it is because of my storytelling, my pacing, the enunciation of my words, all that. That's what I want to get good at. I want to reach the top 1% of the 1% of top performance at storytelling and education content. To do that, I need repetition. I need to do all the steps which are here. That's my detailed plan. I want you to write this down. If you're in KCC right now, if you're a member, you, are, you already paid, you're a member. I want you to go into KCC and write a post in the newly created challenges section describing this. I will come in there, give you feedback. If you are not in KCC, it's fine. Do it in the comments section. If you're watching this live, you can't do it right now, but I'm going to upload this as a regular video. And in that case, you can actually write it in the comments section, your detailed plan. That's your homework. You must do it in order to succeed at this. All right, you're going to do the homework. Few other things. I'm going to have two tiles pop up at the end of this video. One is going to lead to the sleep video, which you're going to learn how to master sleep. The other is going to be to the next video. Tomorrow's lecture is going to be entitled how to make the greatest comeback of your life. So same time as today, attend the lecture tomorrow, how to make the greatest comeback of your life. So I want you to enable notifications for that. So that's your homework. Write down your goals, goal, like single goal, the single skill that you want to master. Write down the detailed steps on how you're going to get there. Then you're going to either watch the sleep video or make yourself a notification for tomorrow's lecture. And with that, I conclude this lesson about the magic hourglass method on how to master anything. I appreciate your time. I, will, I believe it was well spent. And all right, have a nice day. I'm enjoying the beautiful scenery here at, in Hawaii. Cheers.